everybody. Welcome to iCube episode 37. This is Dr. Alice Lee and it should be March 2020 right now. I hope you're having a great year and I hope you're sticking to your New Year's resolutions, okay? All right, so I want to introduce my guest. I have another special guest this month. Um, not only is he one of my favorite free online access medical ed education authors, um, he actually has credentials. <laughs> he, he is um, an associate clinical professor at the University of the Incarnate Word School of Osteopathic Medicine. He is uh, a co-creator and co-founder of the Teaching Institute in San Antonio, Texas, and creator and founder of uh, Rebel EM, Dr. Salim Rizai. Dr. Rizai, I'm so excited that you're here, um, a guest on my, on my blog. I know. Thank you for having me. And just call me <laughs> Sal. Let's keep this informal, right? We're going to be talking about a case. Let's just have a good time. Fantastic, Sal. I appreciate your willingness to come on. I'm just so excited. You are definitely one of the one of my favorite authors out there. Now, it's it, there's something very uncanny that's happened in the past a few years with my blog. Every time I do research for a subject or patient uh, scenario, I always wind up on your blog. I always and I saw so many of my case, my cases have have. Uh, information and, and little bits from your blog. So um, I hope you allow me to do that. So it's foam, right? <laughs> That's right. That's why we put it out there. We're trying to just share and just trying to raise the level of care that everyone is doing. And so that's why we put it out there for free. So absolutely yeah. feel free to keep using it. All right. So, so Sal, this is a 73 year old lady who has a history of hypertension, hydrohernia. She uh, has had uh, pancreatic cancer and was had resection of the pancreatic cancer with a splenectomy, and she's had her hydrohernia repaired. Um, and she comes in with the acute onset of constant thoracic back pain, so posterior back pain. Um, she said it began about nine hours before she came in. Um, she's never had it before. She does have some lower lumbar back pain, but she's not had this particular back pain before. She um, took a prednisone, actually, before she came in, accidentally thinking it was a Percocet. That was a leftover Percocet. Didn't help her. So she says that, you know, she had some alcohol last night with her dinner, but that was about an hour and a half before she started having this pain in her back. And sometimes it kind of raided up the back of her neck into her jaw. This is her past history. Very minimal, somebody who's 73. Hypertension, hiatal hernia. She had the pancreatic cancer. Uh, surgical history, she had the higher hernia repair, she had a pancreatectomy and a splenectomy. So that was several years ago. And then meds, very minimal, thyroid and losartan. Um, so then blood pressure is 150 over 75, her heart rate's 80, respiration is 15, and her temp is 98.1 orally, and her saturation in the is 98%. And just in general, she's actually well-developed woman. She's looking 73-year-old. She's lying on her left side, though, and she looks rather uncomfortable, right? The rest of her physical exam really is not that remarkable at all. So this is her EKG. Any thoughts on that, Sal? Well, that's what I was just looking at. Um, so the one thing that jumps out at me is the low amplitude of the QRS. Uh-huh. Um, appears to be sinus, and yeah. I'm not seeing any ischemic changes. Uh, V1, V2 have flipped T waves. Outside of that, just the low amplitude of the QRS is the biggest thing that's catching my attention. Yeah, nothing that jumps out at you. I wasn't really concerned about this EKG for and a, a real, uh, like a STEMI that I, or ACS even, uh, that I would um, treat immediately or call the cath lab for. What are you thinking at this point? If you, you had this uh, much information about her? Yeah, there's a few things I'm thinking about. So I would have a few more questions that I'd want to ask. So yeah. one thing you said is pancreatic cancer status post resection. So I would want to know how long ago that was. That is was that about something... six years ago. Okay. And then the second thing I'd want to know is you also said hiatal hernia status post repair. And I'd want to know how recently that was repaired. It was the same time. Okay, so also six years ago. Now, one thing you threw in there, and I don't know if you did this on purpose or not, is you said she accidentally took prednisone. And my question is, is I didn't see that on her medication list. So where is the prednisone coming from? What dosage is that? Is that something she forgot to report to me? 
That's fantastic, Sal. Um, I actually don't know why she had prednisone, but the fact that you paid attention and wondered why a patient would have prednisone at home, that is really a sign of a, a very astute clinician, Sal. Um, and the reason I ask is because people who are on long-term steroids can get osteoporosis and then can develop compression fractures in their back. So that's the reason I'm asking. Uh, as far as the hiatal hernia status post repair, that's kind of remote and a long time ago. Uh, but you could always have like referred pain if there was like, uh, you know, a recurrence of that hiatal hernia or a volvulus from that or a complication from the surgery. Although six years out, I wouldn't expect to see that. And then pancreatic cancer is definitely one of those kind of red flag symptoms of back pain. Yeah. Anytime somebody has, you know, prostate, renal, breast, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, you think about METs to the spine. And so those are kind of my, my initial thoughts um, and just hearing the case and, and the way it's played out. Right. That's fantastic. So what other differentials at this point do you think? So aortic dissection or AAA would be something that I would think about. Her blood pressure was 150 systolic, so I, I wouldn't expect to see that, but that's kind of more of a, a long-term disease, so uh, definitely something we should think about. Um, and then some other things that I, I want to know information about. So, you know, back pain is, is such an interesting uh, chief complaint because we see it all the time, and right. more often than not, it's nothing. It's musculoskeletal. Yep. It's those, it's those bad cases that we retrospectively come back to that we always like kick ourselves in the rear for. And so I like to actually go through this list of things as I'm working on my differential of things I don't want to miss. So for example, was there any trauma? You said she was drinking. Did she fall down and land on her butt or land on her back? So is there a possibility that there was some kind of trauma? Has she had any unexplained weight loss? So now I start thinking about you know, kind of cancer type things. Are there any focal neurologic deficits? So is there something that is impending on the spinal cord that I need to be worried about? She's obviously over the age of 50. So that's already something that kind of increases my sensitivity for how conservative I'm going to be. Right. She's having fever. Is there an infectious cause? Maybe uh, she has like osteomyelitis or discitis. Um, Hopefully, as a 73-year-old, there's no IV drug use, but we do <laughs> certainly see that in, in younger patients um, and homeless patients and psychiatric patients, so something to consider. And then the history of cancer, and then finally, the, the AAA um, and aortic dissection kind of in the mid-thoracic. Obviously, anything cardiac and pulmonary is in play. We've already got that EKG, and the one thing that stands out is the low amplitude, so you start worrying about things like uh, pericardial effusion or something like that. That that's terrific. Now, um, what uh, studies would you order at this point? I mean, you've met her, you've examined her, you've got an EKG. Um, what studies would you want to get to kind of dissect through all of those differentials to yeah. try to drill down to the better one, the, the most likely differential? Am I not allowed to go right to MRI? That's not <laughs> available. <laughs> <laughs> That was a joke for everybody who's listening. That was a joke. I'm not being serious. Oh, you, it, would be a, I, it would be ideal, I guess, huh? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about the case. I mean, it, ultimately, we're going to get to imaging. So I, I think I would start off with just a, a CBC with differential. And that would kind of, you know, lead me toward infectious etiology or, or something else that's going on. I would want a chemistry. And the reason I'd want a chemistry uh, isn't necessarily for anything that I suspect, although multiple myeloma could be something that comes up with a chemistry. Yeah. Yep. But if I'm thinking about doing some kind of contrasted study, um, I would want a creatinine at least. Yes. And I want to make sure the electrolytes are okay. I would do a troponin. I would do a BNP. I'd probably do a two-view chest x-ray um, and hope that they would be able to get two views of the thoracic spine as well with that. Um, and then we've already done an EKG. Uh, set rate CRP can be helpful. Uh, I might send those off inexpensive tests could be helpful. Um, and I think that's what I would start off with initially to see what I got back. That's very much like the way I think. Did you say you wanted a lipase as well? Oh, and a lipase. Thank you. LFTs and a lipase. Um, she didn't drink a whole lot. She did not fall. So those are excellent questions. And the differentials you've gone through, Sal, is terrific. I mean, just really, really terrific very broad, and that's the way it has to be with back pain. 
So let me just continue. And I, um, we got a chess film a little bit after. What do you think? That is an old person's chest. (laughs) 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 Um, (laughs) uh, So the, I, I usually like to go through these kind of in a, in a very systematic way. So to make sure I don't miss anything. Uh-huh. So the first thing I do is I do airway, which is just looking at the trachea, make sure there's no deviation, breathing, looking at the lung fields, making sure there's nothing going on in the lung fields. C for uh, cardiac um, and the big vessel that comes out the aorta. And just in those three, I don't see anything obvious. Um, D is diaphragm. So I like to look around the diaphragm. Sometimes you can have free air under the diaphragm or a diaphragmatic rupture or something else, hiatal hernia. Um, E is for like everything else, soft tissues, bones, to make sure I don't forget, looking for lytic lesions or that sort of thing. Um, And then if they have any tubes or anything, if they're an ICU patient. So in this scenario, um, what I think I'm seeing is uh, pretty normal except for that. Uh, patient's left hemidiaphragm seems to be a little elevated. Right. Um, is the big thing that's kind of jumping out to me. So then, um, as I was just chatting with her, she was um, talking, and then suddenly she started moaning in pain, and I just was uh, a little bit distracted by that. So I just went ahead and told the nurse to give her fentanyl for the pain because she seemed to be acutely in pain. Um, all right. So I ordered, you know, CT scan and a chest x-ray and EKG and labs. And then in a very short while, this is the first set of labs that came back. Lipase level, huh? <laughs> and then a troponin. So this is the high sensitivity. What troponin do you guys use? We just have the, the conventional. Okay, so a 77 is basically a 0.5. Zero seven of your so indeterminate so indeterminate right okay um I mean that's kind of the biggest thing that's jumping out at me what would you do yeah so I would do a couple of things first thing I would go grab my ultrasound and uh uh, I I would go actually ultrasound the heart um and I'd be looking for any signs of like RV dilatation wall motion abnormalities pericardial Uh effusion. Um, Just a quick look because you can take a lot of things off the table very quickly with ultrasound. So then, you know, at that point, it's like roughly 6 a.m. I'm I'm 6.30. I'm finishing off my shift. I handed her off to my colleague. But when that troponin came back, I immediately thought, oh, boy, this actually could be ACS or uh, non-STEMI because she's a woman. She's older and women present with a typical symptoms. So I went ahead and just started on IV nitroglycerin and heparin and handed her off to my colleague. And then later that day, I woke up from my sleep and checked the lab. This is about two hours after the first troponin. Yep. So that would be a uh, 0.26 in your shop. Yep. And if I remember correctly on the EKG, I had mentioned something about V1, 2, and 3 were a little bit concerning. Yeah. Um, and I would, have, I would have liked to have seen a previous EKG. Again, it's always easy with the retroscope, right? When you're going prospectively, it's so hard with the yeah. big differential yeah. in these people. And they use, like you said, they present atypically. Um, they, it's never like... <laughs> You know, they'll come in and just say weakness, which is one of my <laughs> least, favorite, least favorite complaints. So, yeah. So I was very grateful or happy that I started her empirically on nitro and heparin for ACS. Um, so then this is the uh, cath report. She got taken to the cath lab a few hours later. And the cath report shows there was an 80% ulcerative plaque in the mid-LAD. And so she had a PCI with a stent in the mid LED with a stent in the proximal LED. And then there was a 99% subtotal posterior descending artery lesion, and the cardiologist uh, put uh, a stent in there as well. So. I got to tell you, ACS, to, to be fair, and just to show people how hard this is, 
Uh, ACS was definitely in my differential because I would have ordered a troponin. Of course, yeah. Um, but it wasn't one of my top differentials uh, as we were working through this case. Yeah, and I will agree. I will tell you honestly, I didn't either. And then when the troponin came back, I was like, oh my gosh, I should have started her on nitro when I first saw her because I have a, actually a tendency to be very, uh, very cautious about different pains and people come in with you know, nausea or whatever even if there's no chest pain. And this lady had no chest pain, zero. She repeatedly said she had no chest pain. And um, I, I usually am pretty pretty quick with the nitro, but on her, because she sort of started moaning in front of me, I was a little bit distracted. And I just wanted to get her something for pain, so I ordered fentanyl. But fortunately, that troponin came back pretty quickly. And when it, went, when it was positive, I immediately switched it over to a treatment for ACS. <laughs> So, so on this patient's case, I think that would be good to kind of briefly go over um, acute myocardial infarction in women. So then in my research, I dug up this one article that was pretty recent in uh, 2016 in circulation, and it's the American Heart Association's scientific statement regarding uh, acute myocardial infarction in women. Okay. So cardiovascular heart disease afflicts 6.6 .6 million women annually. Greater than 53,000 actually die annually of an MI. Um, more women die than men within the first year after their first MI, and then that first five years after an acute MI or the first MI. Um, more women die, have heart failure, or suffer a stroke than men. Um, women more commonly present with non STEMIs, like this lady, <laughs> um, more likely to have unusual mechanisms such as um, spontaneous coronary dissection or coronary arterial spasms. Women with ACS and those um, after coronary revascularization have longer hospital stays, they have higher in hospital mortality, they have more bleeding complications, and they have more readmissions. So there's really distinct differences between women, men and women in cardiovascular disease. Women are at significantly higher risk of bleeding complications with thrombolytics in acute MI. And, well, and this point is a good point, which is that women have lower 30-day mortality with primary PCI than with thrombolytics. Now, this is very interesting. Smoking is the single most important preventable cause of MI in women. Smoking is the leading cause of MI in women ages less than 55. So then in this article, it talks about, this chart talks about uh, typical versus atypical symptoms in women who present with an acute myocardial infarction. We are all very familiar with these symptoms. Typical symptoms for AMI is, you know, chest pain and pain radiating to the jaw, neck, shoulders, your arms, epigastrium. There's associated symptoms of dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, lightheadedness, and diaphoresis. What the article considers that atypical symptoms are chest pains that are sharp, pleuritic, burning, aching, soreness, reproducible. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> um, and then there are other symptoms that are really rather atypical in women that come in with AMI, which are you know unusual fatigue, unusual shortness of breath, upper back and chest pain. So my lady had upper thoracic pain. In fact, I sat her up and I said, is this part of your back what you're talking about or is it down here? And she specifically um, said it was the upper part, the thoracic back. Um, so the um, other symptoms that are atypical for AMI in women, neck and jaw and arm, shoulder, back, epigastric, flu-like symptoms, dizziness, generalized anxiety and scared feelings, uh, generalized weakness, indigestion, and palpitations. So I, I think the big thing here, the big clinical take-home message in terms mm -hmm. of how we care for these patients at the bedside mm -hmm. is that and I'm not a woman, obviously, but <laughs> women, when they present and complain, complain differently than men do. Men tend to be a little more objective and come mm. out and say pain. Right. And women tend to describe things kind of in a softer way. Uh, like, I don't feel well, or I'm uncomfortable, or I feel nauseous, or I feel weak. And so because of the way that they describe those symptoms, I think there's a downplay in terms of treatment, in terms of what we're doing for them. And right. what's actually been shown is right. women actually get less invasive and therapeutic modalities That's than right. men do. 
That's right. And, and that's the key point is that these women won't come in always saying chest pain or chest pressure. They'll have these atypical symptoms. Mm -hmm. And then we tend to downplay those. And then they miss out on the therapy that they need. And therefore, they have higher mortalities and higher rates of heart failure. Exactly. All right. Learning focus number two is very fast. Uh, spontaneous coronary arterial dissection, SCAD. Do you know much about this, Sal? I just remember that it was in pregnancy <laughs> and women. That's about the only thing I remember that it can happen. That's the last, last time. Uh, I've had one case, actually. I was a resident, and it wasn't somebody who was postpartum. And they were having an MI, oh. and, and they were actually having a spontaneous coronary dissection. Oh, wow. I, I knew very little about uh, SCAD, so I wanted to quickly let us go through this, uh, just a few teaching points. So, uh, like I said earlier, women are more likely to have um, unconventional mechanisms of coronary artery disease, such as SCAD. Uh, this is a very, rare, very, very rare form of, of an acute MI. Uh, it is said perhaps 0.2 to 4% in the patients undergoing CATS have coronary artery dissection. And then apparently 10.8% of women less than 50 who present with AMI or ACS have uh, SCAD as their etiology for their MI. Um, so spontaneous coronary artery dissection is associated with uh, peripartum or postpartum status. And then it's associated with oral contraceptive use, uh, associated with exercise. I better stop working out, I think. <laughs> um, Connective tissue disorders and vascular disease. Um, SCAD most is commonly involves the um, LAD, uh, and there are no definitive treatment guidelines. Um, there's the following other ways people have treated it, which is conservative therapy, thrombolytics in the pre-PCI era, PCI, and cabbage as treatment. Now, overall, early mortality is actually quite low with spontaneous coronary artery dissections, which is good. Um, the complication rate is actually higher, though, in the PCI-treated patients. Um, apparently, the Mayo Clinic has a, the largest series of SCAD patients, and they report 17% um, recurrence rate and a 10-year mortality of 7.7%. And apparently a MACE rate of 47.4%. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> I wonder how much of that is driven by revascularization, though, and, and as opposed to mortality. Yeah, so it included heart failure and right. MI and death, like you said. Well, Sal, thank you so much. You did so much teaching. That's so great. I loved having you here today. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I love doing these things. That's great. Well, I am uh, so honored that you actually re replied to me when I, I tweeted you. So next time we'll have your partner in crime. How about that? There we go. <laughs> That's fine. We'll get the Swami on here. Yes, that would be awesome. So, well... Thanks everybody for watching this month. I really, truly, truly, truly appreciate your viewership every month. I do hope that my labor of love, which is IQ, helps you learn uh, to treat patients better and uh, more kindly. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next month. Bye Sal, take care. Bye, thank you.